Thank you so much, Nikki, for that kind introduction. And of course, for the Berkman Klein Center for having me here in this luncheon series. Sorry, I'm trying to understand how that works, honestly. Um, just tell me if that's OK. Is that OK? Better. Cool. Uh, thank you. So thank you for the Berkman Klein Center for having me, for supporting my research, for having me for like, I think, one and a half years now and of course for the German Research Foundation for funding my research. Indeed, what I'll talk about today is part of what Nikki just described from our book that I co-write with Adrian Rauchfleisch from the Taiwan National University. And this delves into kind of like where writing online communication happens, how they kind of like form, what the structure is, and indeed we do this comparatively with Germany and the US. Uh, from a theoretical perspective, I'll just like go quickly through this just so you like, know where I'm coming from theoretically. We're coming from uh, Yokai Benkler's perspective or theory of the network public sphere, which kind of like posits that the Internet's network character emphasizes the already existing constellation of numerous connected publics. Indeed, the public sphere as the one thing never existed in the first place, neither offline nor online. However, it was always like a mixture of bigger, of smaller publics, some more powerful, some less powerful. The internet in this sense offers new actors the opportunity to voice their opinion, to potentially influence public opinion, and indeed have influence on the real life political consequences. Uh, in this sense, counter publics are a specific part, a specific public that are low in power, that are usually excluded by the mainstream one way or the other, and that perceive themselves as excluded as well. So this is usually a double bind, where they're excluded, they know that they're excluded, and they kind of like first go back, try to form a counter public, where they have like their own space, where they can talk about their issues, and then kind of like try to influence the more mainstream publics. Counter publics, however, and you might have heard that in this luncheon series before, counter publics, this term, is often used for progressive publics for publics that are oppressed, kind of like try to find their way in the mainstream public sphere to be heard. This is, for example, true for the social justice movements, for the women's movements, for also for the workers' movements. And they all try to find, like, to get a voice in the public discussion to get their voices heard. However, counter publics do not have to stand for progressive values. This is something that goes back to Nancy Fraser, who said that counter publics indeed do not have to be like pro-democratic values that can be anti-democratic, and indeed that's how we're looking at right-wing uh, actors in Germany as well in the US. And this is also something that has been adapted in recent years in research to kind of like make sense of what the right-wing is trying to do, and kind of like to make sense of the theoretically, the attempts, what they're doing, and how they're being dealt with. What we can see when we look at the right-wing, and this is true more generally speaking for offline and online connections and online social movements, is that we can talk of hybrid movements, uh, environments, sorry. This is something that Andrew Chadwick has posited, and this is kind of like that online and offline nowadays are intertwined. Like we can't have one without the other. We can't have online activism, with activism without boots on the grounds, technically. So the goal is always to translate this selectivism, as it's sometimes called, to the offline world. Social media in this way has proven to be like a very good source and a very important tool for actors, especially for counter-public actors, but in general, this is obviously because they emphasize and contextualize offline events. They make sense of the events, and I'll talk a bit about a few events and how the right-wing actors made use of social media in that regard. Indeed, they can work for online as well as outward-oriented communication, if you're wondering what that is. Inward-oriented communication is we speak to our own counter-public. They try to kind of like make sense of events, they kind of like use it as a training ground, as Nancy Fraser put it, and to kind of like have their own space where they communicate to themselves and they try to form a collective identity. So they kind of like have this imagined community, as Anderson put it. Uh, Outward-oriented communication is something that like counter-publics are communicating to the outside. They're trying to reach the mainstream public spheres. They kind of like try to influence the public agenda. However, social media can be gamed, as we've seen in recent years. Hashtags can be captured. Threats, discussions, threats can be distorted and derailed. Online personas can be faked, as we know with Russian trolls. Uh, and this is all being done by different groups, but the right wing is very much active in this regard. However, and this is also what I will talk about today, platforms can involuntarily contribute to the formation of these counter-publics and indeed to the segmentation of publics 
And the question is how we deal with that, how we can identify that, and where that happens. So let's go to the right wing. So when was the last time you cared about the Dutch elections? Did you ever care about them? Well, this is a Google Trends slide that I picked from like a few days ago. And there we can see like the general worldwide um, attention or look like attention for elections. And indeed, the first thing we see is the Dutch elections, then the French elections, two elections that were very much like debated or like they were very much in the limelight due to right-wing populist parties and their prominence and the worldwide fear, generally speaking, that they'd actually reach government status, which they in both cases didn't do. Then we had the UK elections, the Kenyan elections, and the German elections where we already see like, okay, the attention for elections is kind of over. Then we had US elections and especially the Alabama elections in the end. But we can see like the right wing or the interest or the fear of the right wing is very much like on people's minds. Otherwise, for example, the Dutch elections, no offense to, to my friends from the Netherlands, wouldn't have been that popular in the worldwide attention. So what do we know about the online right wing? In general, it's gaining uh, in popularity in the West. We see that in the De Netherlands, we see that in France, in the US, we see that in Germany, and the elections where right wing populist parties are very much active and trying to, to be elected. Indeed, and this is not even touching on countries in Europe like Austria, like Hungary, like Poland, where right wing parties are actually in government. So we can see that right-wing populism is very much prominent and successfully so in the West. But we also see that new versions of the far right are establishing themselves. Indeed, for example, when we talk about the alt-right, when we talk about identitarians, this is all new right. Discourses, however, and although we can see this trends happening internationally, discourses of the far right are usually embedded, are deeply embedded, in the national context. So for example, in Germany, the far right always has to deal with like the Hitler era as a benchmark, and which is like something that defines where, what they talk about and in what way they talk about. And the yes, it's of course deeply intertwined with slavery and what they kind of like how they deal with that and what they can like push for. Uh, so these discourses are very much uh, different and uh, embedded in national context. However, right wing actors connect on and offline internationally. Indeed, people look, see how right-wing actors from Germany inter, like, work and what they talk about and vice versa. And we see this in, in a bit in examples, actually. So what do we know about the online right-wing in the United States? Well, we know that it's mostly detached from the conservative mainstream. That is something that we can generally say. This might have changed a little bit in, recent, like in the last year, potentially. However, not that much. We still have a very, like, Online and offline, the right wing is very much fragmented in itself. It's kind of like not connected to the mainstream, generally speaking. And if we look at crime rates in the US, an FBI report that foreign policy reported on said that white supremacists, supremacists sorry, were responsible for 49 homicides and 26 attacks from 2000 to 2016. And so they were more so than any other domestic extremist movements. That kind of like shows you the prominence, the prominence, obviously notoriety of the far right in the US. Uh, and in recent years, we see that with the picture obviously from Charlottesville, we had the rise of right-wing alternative media, as well as the alt-right and an attempt to unite the right. And this is what I'll talk about now for a second, where we have this picture from counter protesters from Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And this is interesting because it kind of like shows this hybrid environment that Andrew Chadwick talked about. And we kind of like want to highlight how the internet and how the uh, offline world kind of like were intertwined. Indeed, it was organized by a white nationalist. The goal was first and foremost uh, to protest the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville, as well as to unite the right. There were some conflicting goals because there were so many groups involved. Uh, so there's not this one goal. Uh, indeed, if you look at the poster for the Unite the Right rally, it kind of looks like an all-star lineup from like a concert. Um, the participants, amongst other, were like alt-right personalities, were people from the Klan, from militias, from libertarians, uh, the neo-socialist movements, traditionalist workers' party, etc. So they were all there, uh, and they all talked about this together on Facebook, on Reddit, on 4chan, Twitter, YouTube, Discord, to name but a few. 
especially Discord was in this regard very important, where they kind of made use of the platform to kind of like plan how they even got to Charlottesville and did, road, did plan road trips together, et cetera. In Charlottesville, of course, in August, it came to a clash of protesters and counter-protesters, as we are all very much aware of, which resulted in numerous non-lethal injuries, the death of two state troopers in a, a helicopter accident crash, and the killing of Heather Heyer by a white nationalist who drove a car into a group of counter-protesters. Um, later on, this, of course, was very much discussed in the public mainstream, in the public uh, spheres, However, it was also very much discussed, obviously, by right-wing activists, by far-right, on Reddit, on Facebook, you name it. They made videos on YouTube to kind of like make sense out of what happened, to kind of like regain the ground for like how they see what happened, and uh, finally to play the victim card that they were attacked, of course. In Germany, on the other hand, we have a slightly different perspective of like the far-right and the right-wing. It's still very much detached from the conservative mainstream. However, online, this is very different from the United States, the right wing is very much united, and usually around like institutions like political parties, like the NPD, which is a right wing extremist party that is nowadays luckily almost um, without influence and voters. This has a different reason though, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, when we talk about crime in, in Germany, it's worse than in the US. We have 84 homicides between 2000 and 2016, which is a sharp rise, generally speaking, in right-wing extremist violence. And we have also right-wing related crimes with over 2,000 attacks on refugee homes since 2015. And this is actually like a conservative um, like number. There are numbers that are much higher than that of attacks on refugee homes. We have, in general, like, since 2013, three new actors in Germany, in the German right. We've got Pegida, which is a civil society movement. Uh, you can see one of their marches here, uh, which is also like not very relevant currently, but which used to be very much so a few years back, which kind of like united some of the new actors and gave them a platform where they could speak. For example, the identitarian movement, which you might have heard of, who are like this right-wing extremist movement, and some of the left in Germany call them neo-Nazis with MacBooks because they kind of look like hipsters. They kind of like try to appeal to students. They try to sanitize, indeed, right-wing extremist thoughts and racism and kind of like make it more appealing and like back it up more theoretically. At least that's their attempt to do so. And finally, we've got the AFD, which is a right-wing populist party that has ties to right-wing extremist movements, although they always kind of like try to distance themselves, at least officially, but they factually don't do that. Indeed, the AFD is now represented in most state parliaments in Germany, as well as the national parliament, where they are the third strongest party. And uh, it doesn't look like they will go anywhere in recent year, in the next few years. The example I have from Germany is a Defend Europe. This, if you're wondering what that is, that is a left-wing like kind of caricature of the Defend Europe mission which was organized by the right-wing extremist identitarian movement, uh, and their goal was, let's charter a boat, let's go to the Libyan coast, and kind of like stop the NGOs who are obviously complicit in uh, bringing refugees to the Europe to, because they kind of like frame it as like, they want to stop the deadly illegal immigration into Europe. So that was the general idea of the, um, of the identitarian movement. And this was kind of like an interesting story in itself because they kind of looked at different platforms to get money, then like bank accounts to store their money. PayPal, for example, kicked them off their platform. But in the end, they went to this right-wing extremist re, uh, crowdfunding site called Researcher, where they managed to get over $230,000. They asked for $80,000. Indeed, this shows what I talked about earlier, that these things are monitored like throughout internationally. So this is a German language kind of, like project by the identitarian movement that got funded on a US site by far right people from all over the world to kind of like defend Europe, obviously. Well, they planned and funded this all online and in summer last year, they kind of like took the sea star, that was the boat's name, 
and wanted to go to the Libyan coast. That was kind of like an odyssey in itself because some of the boat crew actually uh, applied for asylum in the way, which is ironic as I think, uh, as well as the boat's captain was, uh, I think was in jail for one night. And then finally when they reached the Libyan coast, they were there for one week and afterwards declared victory. They even had a mission accomplished banner in one of their YouTube videos. And they received a lot of attention by the mass media as well as on social media for these actions, both nationally as well as internationally. And obviously throughout this trip, always went back to social media, went back to Instagram, went back to Twitter, to Facebook, to YouTube, to kind of like show what they were doing. So what we can see, and if you like spend a little time looking into the right-wing activities online, you'll always come back to one platform, usually. This is always YouTube. YouTube is being used to kind of like spread the word, to kind of make sense of events like Charlottesville, to promote their ideas like the Defend Europe mission, and generally to interact with a bigger mainstream audience, which is always there. Indeed, however, YouTube is very much under research in a way. You can see here the academic publications, uh, generally speaking, on social media platforms, and YouTube has 1.5 billion users. Twitter is 330. However, these are Twitter numbers, the blue one here, and this is YouTube. This is the red one is Facebook. Not to talk about the others. So YouTube is under research. However, YouTube is the second most visited website in the world with 1.5 billion users in the month. One billion hours are watched every day on YouTube. It's the most used platform by teenagers in the US with 91%. Uh, Facebook is being used by 53% and Twitter by 37%. So YouTube is very much used by teenagers and obviously other demographics as well. YouTube, however, is also a news site for people. Indeed, the Reuters Institute Digital News Report states that 14% in Germany and 20% in US use YouTube, uh, use YouTube for news. And of course, as I just showed, YouTube is also used very actively by the right wing to establish their alternative media, media that kind of like counters the mainstream narratives and where they speak truth. Um, how can we even get an idea of what is happening on YouTube? This is very much like connected to the, to the thing I just talked about, that it's hard to do research on YouTube because there's just so much. You know, like one video often has like a few thousand comments. So where do you start? What do you do? And generally speaking, we can differentiate on YouTube three different <laughs> aspects, the levels, the actors, and the connections. So the levels are generally what do we see on YouTube? We see channels, we see videos, and we see user comments, uh, like connected to that interactions like, dislike. With regards to actors, we generally have channel owners, we have users, we have the YouTube staff who, who curate, uh, curate lists, and we've got YouTube's algorithms. And finally, the connections, and with connections, I mean connections between videos, between channels, who's responsible for these connections. It's either the channel owners or the YouTube algorithms. So what we did is we looked at these channels. Here you can see an example, and just to show the difference, if you see this, featured channels, that's something that Fox News did. That's why they reference all to Fox News channels. However, and that's like what channel owners can do themselves. However, the related channel section is something that, is not, that they can't influence. They can either say, we want that on our channel page or we don't. However, they can't influence what's gonna be related. And that's, you can see, CNN kind of makes sense, right, for Fox News to be related. However, uh, what we see here is the Alex Jones channel, right next to Fox News, as a recommendation by YouTube's algorithm, indeed. And this is kind of like already perhaps concerning. So what we did is, we started with a list of channels, and this is all with Adrian Ralph fleshed together. Um, we, we took we, like our own list of channels that we like kind of looked, for example, we looked through Southern Poverty Law Center's list. We looked at the literature, like De La Porta, Kayani, and Wegemann, for example, have a great list of right-wing actors in the US as well as in Germany. And kind of like went through YouTube and looked for channels that represented these actors that we know from the literature or the Southern Poverty Law Center. And so we had in the US, for example, roughly 320 channels for the right wing 
Then we had took all channels that we could find that were relevant for political parties and actors in Germany and the US. That were roughly 540 in the US and 193 in Germany. And then we took the YouTube mainstream. That is like the channels that are the most prominent in the countries that have the most subscribers, which you know like are truly mainstream. And those were in uh, Germany 100, we took the 100, and in the US we took the top 250. And what we then did is, well, we followed YouTube's channel recommendation system, step by step, for all channels that we had, and we looked what do these channels, or what does YouTube recommend, recommend from these channels ongoing? What are the connections between the channels? We, this is used as snowball method. This is, of course, used to kind of get rid of the bias that we have because we're not claiming that this is exhaustive. We can't possibly get all these channels for every actor throughout YouTube. And so we can like use this step and we go one step, so related channels, two steps and three steps. So we have like a big enough variety of channels that we kind of like make sense of what we're seeing on YouTube and to see what communities are created through YouTube's algorithm. Here what's what we see for Germany. Um, we can see here the, the node size are, is the subscriber count. Uh, so we can see the German YouTube mainstream, which is very big. We can see the international YouTube. This is PewDiePie, if you're wondering why, what's the big actor here. Uh, and in between, we can see media. We can see cl like classical media. We can see YouTube-specific shows that are being created only for YouTube. We can see political parties, which are here, and which are not very relevant, as you can see, kind of like in between the network. And then we've got this big community of right-wing actors, which are, consist of right-wing organizations and alternative media, who then have connections to the international right-wing. So in the next step, we looked at the right-wing specifically to kind of like make sense what's happening there. And here we can see that we see the identitarian movement, which is very prominent in this YouTube bubble. We can see the NPD, which I talked about before, who I said we're very much like without influence currently in Germany because they don't have any voters anymore. Well, look no further than the AFD because they probably are responsible for that, who are closely connected to them on YouTube and who can like draw people in algorithmically into this right-wing bubble. And then we've got like alternative media, conspiracy media, RT German, for example, like Russia Today is in there as one big source of uh, media, of, the, of their media diet. Um, and indeed we can see that when we think about what we just see, that this is called a filter bubble, or what Ellie Parisa called a filter bubble, that is a community, a bubble, that is being pushed forward by an algorithm. This is not done by users. This is YouTube's algorithm and like its suggestions to like, you like this channel, so you might find these related channels interesting as well. So we can also see that politicians and political parties are barely relevant in this case. Uh, although we had a list of over 200 channels for political parties, most of them were not part of it. They, didn't, they weren't linked by YouTube's algorithm. They didn't have a related channels page. They were just like off the grid. You only find them if you're really looking for them. However, we can also see that mass media and mainstream channels are far more popular with regards to views and subscribers than the right-wing bubble. Although we can see that the right-wing bubble is extremely densely connected and pushed together by the YouTube, YouTube's recommendation algorithm and also pushed towards the international right. This, of course, begs the question, how does it look like in the US? Well, this data is two weeks old. I hope you can roughly make sense of it. These, these are 1,342 uh, channels in the network. This is only like a part of the network there, it's in general much bigger because it then also goes quickly into like Russian YouTube, Arabian YouTube, German YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the core of the US YouTube sphere. And here we can obviously like there's this big cluster of like in the middle and there's this one and these will be interesting for us because if we look at what's happening there, we can see that we've got music here, if you're interested in Justin Bieber and Katy Perry, et cetera, these are here. We've got PewDiePie, uh, Logan Paul, who you might have heard in recent weeks, uh, there. We've got Colbert and Seth Meyers and stuff here. And then we come into the political bubble. We have a small, this orange bubble that you can see here is the liberal progressive 
bubble, and then we go full on into conservative media, conspiracy theory, and the new and old right wing. To give a name to some of these channels, we see PewDiePie, we see Logan Paul, and the most important channel, according to YouTube, if you're wondering the note size here is in degree, that is how often a channel is being recommended within the network, the more often it gets recommended by YouTube in this network, the bigger the node. So you can see Alex Jones, although like one point something million subscribers, and PewDiePie, who has over 50 million subscribers, are almost the same in this network. Of course, this is kind of like biased because we can't possibly have all of YouTube's channels, but this kind of like gives you an idea of how relevant Alex Jones is within this bubble. We see the Young Turks as most important channel in the liberal bubble, more important than CNN, for example. We can see Fox News as the, kind of like this channel for, which is in the same bubble and community as Alex Jones. We see, if you're wondering what this is, this is RT, which also is there. And then we go full on into the conspiracy sector and the right wing sector. What's the one under Alex Jones? The one under Alex Jones is local, uh, Lionel Nation, if you're wondering. So, uh, oh, Sticks and Hexenhammer 666. Well, you, you've, you've never heard of him? Um, uh, you, you can try it. Uh, it's, it's a one man YouTube show who very much pushes right wing narratives. So you, you can see, like, they have their own alternative media, they have their own celebrities. These celebrities often, like, interact with each other, criticize each other. Uh, and we can also see something else, because if you look at the network now and the size of the nodes, you see that this basically is all just dots, very small dots, whereas this is much bigger. You can see here, this is much bigger. This is because now the node sizes are according to the subscribers. This is like five, over 50 million. This is the music network. This is like the mainstream network. And here we can really see that this is the mainstream for most of the people on YouTube. This is what they visit. There's TED Talks in there. There's Late Night in there. There's mass media in there. But the political sphere is here and mostly irrelevant for subscriber-wise. Although irrelevant in this way obviously means like that Alex Jones, for example, has over 1 million views, uh, subscribers. Sorry. So we then looked a little bit closer in the right wing bubble to kind of understand what, who are those people in this? Can we make out different communities? And indeed, although it's kind of hard to do that, here we have the religious right. We can see the conspiracy theories, which are still closely connected to the alternative media. However, alternative media, which is headed by Alex Jones once more. Uh, this is, I think, Fox News, which is still in there, being dragged in by like YouTube's, uh, YouTube's recommendation algorithm, sorry. And this is also what you always have to keep in mind. This is not what like, the channels do. This is not what users per se do. But this is how YouTube thinks the recommendation algorithm should work, that these bubbles exist. There we have the anti-feminism um, part, which is very much against political correctness, as they call it, or SJWs, which is short for social justice warriors. Uh, we've got the manosphere here, or as they call themselves, men going their own way. Uh, and, then we've got, and then we've got the far right, which is indeed very interesting because there we can't make out different communities as, for example, we know from the literature, you might know from the mass media, like the difference between the alt-right and the alt-light and white nationalists and white supremacists, etc. Like this is all together, clumped together basically in this. Like the more orange sector is more dominated by alt-right figures. However, there are like David Duke is, for example, in there. Uh, and American Renaissance, if you know that outlet, is in there. And the far right is still like very much like full-blown far right, right-wing extremist. However, there are also English-speaking internationals in there to kind of like promote the same uh, promote the same messages, but from a, for example, European perspective. And then we have the international right-wing, which is, for example, the German right-wing that we just saw. So, what do we say about the I'd like to sum these things up for what we just saw? Well, we can say that political parties and politicians are barely relevant in this network. Indeed, I haven't talked about this, but if you're wondering where politicians are, here and here. There we have over 500 channels for Republicans, Democrats, from like the GOP account to like very some local accounts. We have politicians accounts. We have the Green Party. We have the Libertarian Party. And we have the same result as in Germany. They are like kind of like in these communities but they have few subscribers 
and they don't form their own communities in themselves. YouTube always pushes you to media outlets or more prominent channels, but that doesn't stay within, for example, a political party uh, community. We, in general, we see in this big network two closely connected right-wing bubbles, uh, which, is prominent, like, which is dominated by Alex Jones on the one hand, where also Fox News is, for example, part of, and a more like far-right uh, sector. However, you can also see from this network that although the right-wing is more united than in other networks that I've seen uh, in the literature, it's still very much fragmented into different groups and what they stand for. The one exception is this part here where it's very much intermingling from the algorithm, but we also have to see or keep in mind that the mainstream is still much, much more popular with regards to subscribers uh, and views than the right wing in general. So to sum things up, you can say that YouTube is highly, act like the right wing is highly active and popular on YouTube. We can see that the right wing in general, both in Germany as well in the US, has close connections to conspiracy theory channels. This might not come as a surprise, but we can see this here once more. YouTube's recommendation algorithm does not differentiate between like conservative and far right, for example, that you could see, for example, in this big green bubble where Fox News was in there. And I would say, you know, Fox News is definitely not Infowars. But for YouTube, it's kind of like in the same bubble, in the same community, and YouTube recommends Infowars when you're on Fox News channel. Uh, and that they don't differentiate. That's a problem as far as we think. For the US, we can see that although the right wing is closer together than we've seen in other studies, it's still very much fragmented into different like groups, and it's hard to tell if they'll ever be able to truly unite the right. In Germany, however, we see that it's very much clustered around specific actors and one topic, which is currently the refugee cr uh, crisis and a closely connected Islam which kind of like keeps them going. And if you now say, well, you know, like this is the algorithm speaking, who says that these groups actually interact with each other like we just saw? Maybe YouTube's algorithm just says, this is a community, but the users aren't feeling that. What Anderson called imagined communities. Well, the next study that we did, and we're currently on that for the US, so bear with me, this is just for Germany, is we downloaded all comments from videos from these channels, from the right-wing channels, and looked for user overlap. And each connection here between these channels is at least 10% user overlap. And so what we see is very much what we saw in the related channels. That is, this network is closely, um, is closely connected. We can see the key actors that we saw in the related channels very much through the comments as well. And we expect, or we'll be very much interested to see where that goes, where that goes for the US. Oh, we can see that this is not just like an algorithmic-like result that has no basis in actual user um, behavior. The question, of course, is chicken egg, like what was first? Does YouTube, for example, we don't know how YouTube's recommendation system works. Do, do they take user overlap, for example, as an indicator? That even would make these networks perhaps more scary. Uh, but it might be also the other way around, which is also not very uh, a pleasant thought. However, we can always say, and we have to keep that in mind when we think about this and talk about this, that the mainstream on YouTube is mostly unpolitical, it's gaming, it's YouTube shows, and it's much, much more popular than the political spheres and especially the right-wing spheres. And since I was asked to kind of like make this a little more interactive and bring some like perhaps like poignant questions with me, I have like for discussion three questions, which I, th which I think like I have no clear answer with, but uh, or for, especially when it comes like coming from counter public perspective. That is the first question is, should our recommendation algorithms be political? And now before you say algorithms are always political, I know it's kind of like a pun. Uh, the question is, do we need recommendation algorithms for the political content? Is that something that we want? That political content is kind of like put into the same bucket as music, for example or entertainment. Is it the same? Do we want that from our companies that they do this, that they potentially form these potentially filter bubbles or enforce these? Uh, what's up with the left? That's something that I asked myself both in Germany as well in the US. Uh, now you might of course say, well, you hadn't in your list far left channels. That is true because we want to focus on the far right. 
However, when we look, and when we just take the network from our political actors in the US, these 500 something channels that we took and go with these three steps, snowball method. We have a very similar, although a little smaller network, but we can see the same communities on the far right. However, we don't see that on the far left. We don't see that. We don't see them in the network. I've looked for some Antifa channels that got basically no views, and the question is even, are they really from the Antifa or not? We've, uh, for example, heard, if you might have heard about the Antifa Boston Twitter account, which was actually a far right Twitter account. Uh, so the question is, what's up with them? Where, do they, where are they? Do they even need to be there, for example? Perhaps they need to be somewhere else. And finally, we do talk a lot about Twitter's assumed influence on the US elections, right? Twitter bots, fake news, et cetera. But we're not talking about YouTubes. Although YouTube, as you see, is like very much like we have these two bubbles. And what we see in these bubbles is Pizzagate. We see a lot of like promotion. We see like the success of Alex Jones. We see uh, RT, like Russia Today in there. The question is, why don't we talk about this? Is it just like because it's not less influential than potentially Twitter or what's up with that? And with that, I thank you for your attention. has any questions, we're happy to take them. Okay. And um, can you speak into the mic because we're recording and it won't hear you if it's not into the mic. But. You talked a lot about subscribers to YouTube channels. That's not the way I watch YouTube. I just watch things that people point to when I go watch the video and then I, maybe I'll watch something else and then I don't come back to YouTube until somebody else recommends something else. That's a good question. I would say less so. And how many? I mean, I thought I was the one. I thought I used YouTube in a normal way, but it sounds like there's a whole bunch of people who don't. Mm -hmm. So I would I would say it, it might represent like it, this is obviously a behavior we see. However, a lot of people, as we see with the subscriber counts, use YouTube in a different way. So of course, this is like not representative of the whole population either of Germany or the United States, but. If we think of like how much YouTube is used by teenagers, how much by like uh, 18 to like 34 year olds, it's not like these demographics. We see that YouTube is by far like the most prominent social network there, and also like very much used for news consumption. But I agree, obviously, like people use YouTube differently, and there are, and like some just look at videos and then go back, but some use it like and click from video to video to video. Some go from channel to channel to channel, and many people subscribe. <laughs> um, thanks so much for your talk. I have a hypothesis question and then a question question. As to this question of like why aren't we studying YouTube and why is so much more attention proportionally being paid to Twitter, I wonder if this isn't about the sociology of journalism itself and how much journalists rely on Twitter relative to normal people. So that's like a hypothesis in the yeah. form of a question. Um, and then I had a kind of epistemological question about classification, yeah. um, about how we decide what counts as political content. I sort of think of like the dirtbag left's love of drill, for instance, which is like a, ostensibly a political account, but or certain kinds of content about gaming isn't necessarily political. So for this kind of network analysis, I'm curious how one decides what's the threshold of the political or how you start to tag things that way. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so with regards to the first one, that's actually like something the graph I had was, let me check. We see like some of these networks are very big, so let's go back to this. Oh, this. Uh, so this is actually part of something I wrote about with regards to kind of like thinking about like do we overestimate Twitter? Because I think although Twitter is highly influential and relevant, especially from a journalist point of view, especially also like from an academic point of view, uh, the question is like how relevant is it, in, especially in comparison to other parts? And I would say or my hypothesis here is that it's down to convenience. So like the data is there for researchers and also for journalists, like we can easily like research topics on Twitter and we find voices, much more voices than we usually get, much easier, uh, and platform bias. So we're on Twitter, so we think kind of like Twitter is important. And as a lot of research has shown, like Twitter has like an elite bias. 
uh, with regards to your second question, well, the thing is, or I, I, I totally agree. Like when we look at, especially the, the US network, I think it's a little clearer, uh, it's a little clearer in the German one, but of course, like you, you can't say political is either political or apolitical. We see, for example, we saw with PewDiePie, for example, who had like discussions about racism, uh, that this can very much, very quickly be uh, political. We saw with Gamergate that gaming can be highly political. And so where we, kind of like how we looked at it when we made our list is kind of like go from political actors that are clearly political and say, okay, we want the GOP in there, we want Democratic Party in there, we want the uh, Libertarian Party in there, and, and like there are counts to kind of like th where we say, okay, this is clear cut, and then we kind of like look more closely and see like, okay, obviously, for example, I would argue that the late night shows like Colbert, for example, are clearly political in content. However, like it blurs the, the line between entertainment and, politi and political information and so kind of like, this is always something that you have to kind of weigh upon. That's also why I called this community mainstream and progressive media and politics, because for example, a lot of democratic actors or politicians are in there as well. They're just not relevant. Thank you. This was really fascinating. Um, so again, to your last question, and this is part hypothesis, part question about how much this influences things, but it seems like YouTube is seen as more participatory in some ways than Twitter or Facebook where you can see a headline and you don't necessarily have to click on it to be influenced by it in some way. Do you think that the autonomy that goes into choosing to spend a longer amount of time goes into how we think about just being influenced by others on a platform rather than choosing to participate in a community? Ooh, tough question. Um, so from my communications background, I would say like influencing per se is really hard. Like it's hard to kind of like influence people that they should be, for example, white nationalists. This is like almost impossible if you have like, if you are of a different opinion. How, so I would always be like, okay, you have this content and you have a demand for that. And I think there's a potential for radicalization. Technically there, especially like in these environments where it's like these bubbles and kind of like algorithms might potentially push you in one direction. However, this doesn't mean that you're being radicalized. Like it, it depends very much then on the individual, how they react on the specific content, under what circumstances and then kind of like to, to become more like prone to this kind of content, uh, as well as, for example, coupling right-wing content with other topics, for example, against political correctness, against uh, feminism, or Gamergate, for example, were, were good examples for kind of like how these opp discursive opportunity structures were being used to kind of like push also right-wing content. Uh, thanks as well. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned with uh, the commenters on, on YouTube that there's a significant overlap um, there. I was wondering, um, is there a lot of political bot activity in your view there? Because we've seen like the Oxford Internet Institute is one example of researchers like they've established that on Twitter there's a lot of political bot activity. But I'm curious because you, know, so, you, know, you know so much about YouTube, whether that's the, also the case there. So that's a very good question. And YouTube, like, there was a very good post, and I forgot who wrote it because my memory for names is really bad. Um, but so there's a lot of automation on YouTube, and this leads to like the weirdest videos that you might have ever seen, especially like in the kids sector, where it's like children's entertainment that totally goes crazy. Uh, and so I would say there's potential for uh, bots there. The question is what exactly, and, and how how do you want to do that? Like we, we looked at comment overlap because that's, I think, a straightforward way to kind of like connect, top, uh, connect YouTube channels with each other or videos with each other. The problem then, as you've seen with the OII studies, for example, on Twitter, like how do you identify Twitter bots? Like this is still very hard. Like the OII has, for example, also troubles with actually identifying them. A lot of the times they had this threshold of 50 tweets a day, which, you know, like if you've got time and something to say, you might, you might, actually 
get. Uh, so we kind of like don't have no idea really like how to, to identify YouTube bots. And the question is also, is the effort worth it? But I would assume there are definitely bots in there. The question is how many and uh, if people even like consider them being worth. Like the question is how much people trust in YouTube comments, I think. So that then, because like Twitter seems like a straightforward way. Reddit, for example, seems like a straightforward way. Facebook too, YouTube might be. We ha we'll have to look into that. Thanks for the amazing lecture. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, I mean, I think that we can add the case of Brazil in the right wing that you are uh, developing in our lecture. Uh, and uh, how can we deal, like, uh, I'm looking for the case uh, specific for the Brazil, that uh, the right wing have money and he could put, I, I don't know, this money uh, through the social networks. So uh, connect with the question that you put in the end, what's up the left? And uh, consider the case of uh, another Latin American countries. Uh, what could be this international right uh, wing? I think consider another countries that you're not expert in the lecture. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for your questions. Actually, I would say Yasu, who's here in the room, is it's a much better expert on Brazil than I could ever like dream to be. Uh, so we're talking about this, but like I'm looking at the US and in Germany kind of like because these are contexts I know about, I've read a lot about. So I'm, and I'm kind of like very like hesitant to go into countries where I'm not like confident that I'm like able to like have the full picture and kind of like get an idea of that. Um, the question how to deal with that is in, indeed a very like interesting one. It's always like the question like how much does, like for me the question is how much does social media influence us? And that's like something that we don't have good results on, that we can potentially say this is what happens. For me, social media generally speaking is something that users seek to find an imagined community and to kind of like find these right wing bubbles, to kind of find a shared identity across something like a topic that might be gaming, that might be, you know, white nationalism, unfortunately. But this is something that I think like you can't necessarily do with money, um, although obviously money helps. You can, get the, you can get a lot of attention through money. And this is something that we've seen, for example, the identitarian movement, well, like very prominent in this kind of way. And also like very, we see that in the network. Although realistically, the identitarian movement is like only a few hundred people, but online they seem much, much bigger and more influential. Um, Jonas, thank you so much for the great talk. This is a, a really nice contribution going into YouTube and not yet another Twitter study. So thank you so much for that. Not that I don't like Twitter studies. Um, <laughs> my, my question is how to interpret the communities that form on, on YouTube. So we have a general sense of Twitter and that they're typically um, a more, it's a more elite platform and more politically engaged people are there. If we think about Facebook, it's kind of a broader concentric circle outward with more people participating. Um, where does YouTube fit into that? And how do we conceptualize who's there and who's not? I think, very good question, and I, I don't think I'll be able to fully answer that. I think YouTube is in this way a very like interesting platform that is very different to Facebook as well as Twitter because it can be used in many different ways. So it's, for example, people who can use it for news and can just watch movies. It's like a very passive usage, like also what you said earlier. Like you don't have to interact with YouTube. Like YouTube it doesn't force you to make an account to use it. YouTube doesn't force you to like and to comment. So this is something that we don't necessarily see with other platforms so much, where like your activity is so much like part of the whole thing. Uh, I think YouTube is kind of like a mix though, because it very much allows you to interact with people to kind of like have discussions, to kind of like interact both on a comment level as well as on videos. Like we've seen a lot of videos in the right wing, for example, that answer to each other and that kind of like uh, diss each other basically because they disagree with each other. And so this is like, it, it always comes back to kind of like the different levels that we're seeing on YouTube and where we kind of like want to look at. And I think Twitter, we, we've much more figured out what Twitter can be used for and what we can look for and how this makes sense in a broader network public sphere. Whereas YouTube is like this, because there's so little research on it, it's like this kind of like unknown where we'll have to figure out what its role in society truly is. 
um, my hunch would be that YouTube is for entertainment and basically feeling like and, and for confirmation. So we kind of like go to YouTube because we want to laugh, want to look at cat videos or uh, gaming or music, but or we want kind of like want to see what we think and we want to see people on this vi on the screen tell us that they disagree basically with us. And I think we have to kind of like make sense of what we're seeing. So I know this is like a, a bad answer to like your question, but it's, it's, it's something like we, we're thinking about hard and I think we need to figure out what, what it can be done what, and what YouTube's role in society truly is. Uh, Jonas, I came because I was um, attracted to uh, your doctoral thesis at, at, at Zeppelin on the sociology networking of, of, of climate denial in Europe. Oh, thank you. Um, I wonder what your extended uh, networking studies have uh, turned up since then um, about the degree to which the quantitative disparities um, in, in audience and commenters uh, in the, the denialosphere, if you will, relative to the extremely small number of actual climate scientists um, in, in the real world uh, tells us um, about the rise of, of, of the bot empires in, in climate polemics. Oh boy, uh, thank you. Thank you for reading my thesis. <laughs> But, but the, 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 uh, the money stats being that, that uh, the leading climate denial blog claims 300 million hits and 47,000 yeah. followers, whereas my colleagues who write for, for journals like uh, Climatic Change number in the low hundreds. Yeah. It's a small field. Yes, that's, that's like the field of science communication, especially this goes for climate science as well as like for example, anti-vaxxing movements, where it's like very much, we've got this disparity between like academic knowledge being, having like little readership. However, we always can like think that through public engagement that is blogs, but also through media coverage, there's like this, this wider audience. And um, the thing with climate change skepticism or denial, I feel is like that is also like for example in Germany connected to the right wing. That's what that's why I'm here actually, uh, because uh, a colleague and I, Cornelius Pushman, wrote a paper on basically the climate change skeptics in Germany, where it was also like some of the far right were involved there because they kind of like have a lot of like topics to talk about, and climate change being one of them. And so I feel that climate change skepticism, especially in the U.S., is much bigger than the far right because like it's more it's more popular although like it's more like okay to have this opinion in the US than for example to be like truly white nationalist or think of white supremacy um, so I would say like interestingly enough that in this regard like especially in the US like in Germany it's a little bit different uh, that climate change skepticism in this way, although very much connected, for example, to channels like Alex Jones, might be a topic where you get into like right wing, although this is more, I feel, in Germany than in the US the case. Hi, thank you for this great talk, and there's so much to engage with that it, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, but let me ask you this one certain question. You, you talk about YouTube almost as if it's an autonomous system, um, but it's really a corporation making choices, um, and it's somehow been immune from a lot of the scrutiny and criticism that Facebook and Twitter have had. That's changed with those bizarre um, child videos that I, I still can't wrap my mind around. Um, but what what do you think Google should be doing to make this all a little more transparent and obvious what's happening and what should we be doing if we're so inclined to put pressure on Google so that we can understand what their algorithms are doing to society? Um, that's a good question and I think the first 
the first thing that we should be doing and what where Adrian and I are trying to contribute is kind of like actually make people aware that this is happening. Like with YouTube, we don't have the same kind of research. We don't have this knowledge of what is happening there. Uh, indeed, for example, these networks that I've just shown you are like, I think, like I haven't seen them somewhere else. So kind of like, it's important to kind of like highlight what is happening and then basically to understand what content is actually being watched there, what the content is being produced there, and then to put pressure on Google. So as a German, obviously, I would say, like, you know, governments can regulate. In the US, that's a little less popular, I know. Um, so the really question is, and I think Google, some, in some way, already, like, sees this as a problem and kind of, like, tries to deal with this. Uh, the problem is, like, on YouTube, there's so many channels, though. And, like, it's, it's very hard to kind of, like, get them. And since the videos are videos and not text, per se, it's really hard to, like, know when a video, for example, is right-wing extremist. When it's, for example, sorry, in the German case, when it actually like violates law. Because we can't tell by the text in itself. So Google just should like be made aware of this issue. They should be like hold to scrutiny, uh, as we do with Twitter and Facebook, rightfully so. Um, and they should really like work on this and see this as a problem where they see, okay, we have this giant user base on our platform. I don't think that throwing them off the platform necessarily is the best solution, but they should kind of like see what's happening and re-question like their algorithms. That's at least what they can do. Like we should hold them accountable for what they kind of like help produce. And I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thanks very much for the talk. It was super interesting, Jonas. Um, Adding to the hypothetical question of how YouTube and Twitter can relate to each other. So I, have, I had like two thoughts and I would really love to hear your feedback. So I was thinking that first, for me, YouTube, it's more like in a temporal place that you put things and it's not like so update like Twitter that you are like receiving all the time like super, uh, like, the, like the hottest news, right? That's one thing. And uh, so that would make for me like go to Twitter or to the newspaper instead of going to YouTube to watch political stuff. And the other thought was like uh, uh, YouTube, all the videos are like heavy data. So if you are walking with your phone, you prefer to see Twitter, which is like less costly for you than try to download a video. So that made me think about what about the implications with ne net neutrality with this uh, things and uh, YouTube implication. And I would love to hear your comments. Thanks. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I think definitely like net neutrality is a big, big, big issue for all kinds of like political or like all kinds of content, obviously online, especially video content that is much more like data intensive. And in this way, it obviously harms this. But it doesn't not only like obviously it doesn't limit to far right. It, it just like is, it's harmful to like general online content. So I think that that is straightforward. And I think you're very much right in your assessment that Twitter has a different role in people's like media diets than YouTube. However, we have to keep in mind that YouTube is often used kind of like as a replacement, or not by some people at least, as a replacement to, for example, the news like CNN or Fox News because they kind of like don't see their opinions represented there. And so they kind of like turn to alternative media for example, like Russia Today or other right-wing news sites that are very, at times very professionally done and that can like tell them what they want to hear and promote the issues that they think are important. In this way, kind of like we might think, or this is like a working hypothesis, but this has been said before, that YouTube is kind of like the radio talk shows that we've seen since the 80s, where like people like kind of like talk about, like go in the stream of consciousness about topics and kind of like promote their opinions and are being very much viewed by a younger uh, audience than, for example, the radio shows, but which are, I think, still very much in line from what we've seen in the 80s and 90s and what we see on YouTube now. Cool. Cool. Um, so thanks for coming out. Uh, Jonas will stay at the front for a little bit if anybody wants to ask him a question or just chat about his research. Again, Becca is over here in the red if you're interested in learning more about um, our fellowship and um, in submitting an application. Otherwise, net neutrality, more net neutrality on Thursday and monkey selfies next week. Thanks. <laughs>